Well, hello, my name is Zach Hill, and I am a pastor and teaching elder here at Silver City Church in Mount Sterling, Kentucky. Uh, I am thankful that you have come across this content, either by intention or accident or via someone sharing it for you or with you on social media. Uh, my prayer is that this video and this content edifies you and refines your walk with Christ. Uh, I want to personally reach out to you and greet you before you watch this content and also to say a, a few prefatory words. Uh, the first one is this, unless you are a member at Silver City Church, I am not your pastor. And I say that in love. Unless you are a member at Silver City Church, I am not your pastor. In a age that is hyper-connected via social media and the internet, you can have uh, individuals that uh, listen to solid teaching from solid pastors and they simply latch on to those people and never join a church and say that those men are their pastors. And this is frankly false. Uh, I am not your pastor unless you are a member at Silver City Church. Secondly, it would be this. If you are being edified by this material and this content and want to join us at Silver City Church here in the central Kentucky, eastern Kentucky area, please go to silvercityky.com and view our location and our times. We would love to have you come join us on a Lord's Day. Uh, thirdly, if you are being edified by this and do not have a church home and you're outside the area, still contact us on our website and we will see if we can't plug you into a place in your location that can uh, shepherd you and edify you. Uh, if through this content or similar content connected to it, you uh, have been convicted of your sins and have repented for the first time and Christ is your Lord and Savior and He is Lord, Lord of all, uh, would you please reach out to us? We would love to uh, talk to you about that and give you material and send you uh, on a path of righteousness. Godspeed and we pray His kingdom come. Thanks again for watching. It's great to see everyone again, yet again. It is court day weekend here in Mount Sterling, so you know what that means. After you're done here, go get you something to eat for lunch downtown and then go rest up. You can't go shopping today. You can't do that. You can do that tomorrow. You should have done that yesterday. All right, amen? Any deals this week? No? All right. Well, anyway, this morning we are going to be continuing worshiping the Lord. We have worshiped through prayer and through song, and we are going to now worship um, in the sermon, in the word. So this morning, as we continue our exposition of the letter to Titus, which is serving as our field guide to church planning, let's do a quick recap. Last week, we examined Titus 1, uh, 1 through 4, and we're keyed into the main themes that we'll be cropping out throughout this short letter. Faith, the truth of the gospel, godliness, so forth. Uh, we established who Paul was and who Titus was and saw how even how uh, in these four short verses that intro the letter, we have a whole mountainside, a whole field of theological silver and gold that we can mine. So today we're going to be pushing forward into the field as we survey the land of Titus and begin taking some inventory. This morning, um, by way of introduction, I want to I want to put a picture into your mind. I want you to do a thought experiment with me that you should keep throughout the rest of the sermon and the rest of our time in Titus, honestly. Imagine you are in a field, that field that we've been talking about. Imagine still that in reading your field guide, you see there is already a decent crop of plants springing forth. So you begin to water and fertilize and cultivate and do everything that you know to do and what the field guy says. And, and you see that some growth comes and there's some little pieces of fruit that begin to bud up and you're excited. And, and let's just say it's, a, it's a, some tomatoes. You've got a, a crop of tomatoes. But one morning to your horror, you go out and these tomato plants that were growing tall that had been planted and were doing so well have nearly broken in half falling over. Oh, did, did we forget to do something? What's going on? So you run to your field guide and, and you read about caging and you read about staking. And so you go get your cages or your stakes or whatever you choose and you go along and begin giving support to these plants. Some of them aren't doing well. Some of them are and some of them have potential and need a little bit of extra love and care. But you go along and give these plants support with the cage or the stake or whatever you choose. Now, why do we stake 
tomatoes and cage them. It's to give them support. It's to give the growing plant stability. In a way, a cage or a stake, it acts sort of like a cast, like you would put on a broken bone or, or on an injured limb, doesn't it? It allows the broken, if you will, plant to grow properly. So whether we realize it or not, every sound church needs a cast. It, not a cast of characters, if certainly it does, but a cast. Think of a cast around a broken bone or a, an injured limb. And she needs a cast because if she doesn't, when she's young... She may grow wild and unhealthy and and break. And what is that cast? Do Do we know what it is? Yes, we do. By God's grace, that's what we'll be examining this morning. Would you turn in your Bibles to Titus chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. Titus 1, verses 5 through 9 this morning. Hear the living, inspired, fully sufficient word of God. This is why I left you in Crete so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife, and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination, for an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. This is the living word of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We pray that uh, every heart here today would be um, soil that receives the implanted word. And I pray that you would convict us of our sins. You would reform us and refine us into the image of Christ through your word, not by my power or might or by anyone else's power or might, but by yours, the Spirit of the Lord. God, I pray that you would carry me along by the same Holy Spirit who breathed out the very scriptures we seek to examine this morning. Would you um, be with this? Would this be glorifying to you and a benefit to your people? We pray this in your son's name. Amen. As we come to our text this morning, we come to Paul's own words concerning one of the reasons, one of the theses of the letter uh, uh, to Titus, why he is writing to him. Titus 1.5, listen to this. This is why I left you, Titus, this is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. Paul restates his, his thesis, his purpose for leaving Titus on the small Mediterranean island of Crete, which indicates that Paul and Titus were there again together at some point. We're not sure exactly when, but that's why Paul leaves Titus in Crete or on Crete because he trusts him with difficult tasks, as we talked about last week. And one of those difficult tasks is right here in this little sentence to put re- what remained into order how appointing elders in each town as he was directed to it would seem the initial landing on Crete by Paul and Titus resulted in various churches or local gatherings being established we know that but if the gospel is to spread to the four corners of the earth there has to be some sort of structure it's not a free for all Christ himself has a structure for it in the Great Commission and in how he sent out his disciples. We know we don't know exactly what all entailed the putting into order, uh, how meetings were called or how Titus went about doing this. But one thing we do know that needed to be established uh, for for order and support and stability was the appointment of elders. This is interesting, isn't it? There are a few insights contained within this passage that uh, we need to briefly consider. The first is this, uh, semantically the phrase, put what remained into order in the original language uh, connotes setting a broken bone. Here here comes the cast imagery again. So, So this is why I left you in Crete, Titus, to cast up the broken bone of the churches in the place so, so they can grow healthy. Secondly, we have to ask ourselves, what was one way that the broken bone could be set? Remember the tomato intro, stability. And stability, how, according to the text, by appointing elders. 
Here Paul is exhorting Titus to establish church leadership, those who would be responsible for pastoring, for teaching, for shepherding, uh, for making decisions, for guiding the people along, and the various matters that pertain to the local church ministry there in Crete. Uh, The term elder here in the Greek is the word presbyteros, and that's where we get the word Presbyterian from. So the distinctive of a Presbyterian church would be their form of church government, their ecclesiology, which following the root here, presbyteros, would mean what? It's, it's elder-led. It's, it's not congregational where everybody gets like a, a vote, like a democratic type deal. It's, it's elder-led, uh, representatives chosen by the people to lead. Uh, very similar to our uh, form of government. And why do you think that is? Because there are a lot of Presbyterians that helped found America. What is an elder? That's the second thing we need to consider thinking about an elder. What, what is an elder? Is it someone that's old? Well, it can be if we're talking about the fifth commandment and respecting our mother and father and, and elders by extension. But here, as well as in the other places in the scriptures, elder means a, a leader of a group of people. Uh, We first see the term or really the idea of an elder in Exodus chapter 18 when Moses' father-in-law Jethro, not Jethro from the Beverly Hillbillies, but Jethro, uh, the priest of Midian, uh, he he, uh, suggests appointing uh, elders over groups of fifties and hundreds and thousands. You've you've probably heard this account. Uh, The New Testament uses three words interchangeably simultaneously that mean the same thing. Presbyteros, which means elder. Episcopos means over or bishop. I like that one. That's one of my favorites. And poimeno, uh, shepherd. All of these mean pastor. They all mean uh, that function and office of a church overseer, a church leader. They all mean the same thing. So elders were representative rulers. They were representative men uh, of a select group of people. And what's more, thinking about Exodus again, in Exodus 24, we see 70 representative elders, remember local rulers or leaders representing the body, going up on the holy mountain with Moses and Aaron to share a covenant meal or a contractual meal with God. Now, this is important because in this scene, we are given a glimpse into the various roles that Jesus himself fulfills all at once, and yet he, he delegates these same roles to people. We have the prophet Moses, the priest Aaron, and the rulers and the elders, and then we have the king, God. So an elder is simply a local body representative ruler who is under the authority of the true ruler, right? The prophet, priest, and king, Jesus. Also, notice what Paul says. He says elders with an S, plural. Biblical New Testament church leadership, which is based, as we have just seen briefly, in the Old Testament uh, leadership, showing that God has a a continuous pattern. He is not a God that is uh, disconjuncted. It is a continuity. Biblical New Testament or biblical church leadership is always a plurality of elders. It's never a one-man band, top-down model, anything like that. Paul directs Titus to appoint elders, meaning multiple. You see, absolute power in the hands of one person is a dangerous thing. We've seen that over the past few years, haven't we? Absolute power in politicians or the science or, you know, anybody with the name doctor in front of their birth name, DR, PhD, MD, anything like this, thinking that these elites, the elitinati, the power in the hands of certain people, it's dangerous, isn't it? You see, I, I know men who are soul pastors at churches, and they, they do a fine job, they're good men, but it's an iffy thing, and that it has to make you wonder, how, how much integrity can you spare? A plurality of elders Uh, is actually one of the core commitments here at Silver City. And it's not because we've made it up. It's because it's a biblical standard. And it's also just common sense. It protects the group of people gathered as a a local representative body of Christ from being abused. A plurality of elders means these men, as we will see shortly, they they have to be men. We'll go on and kindle that fire. Uh, Keep, they keep one another in check and they share the responsibility of the flock. Uh, 
no doubt that there are men who are more gifted at teaching, more gifted at, at, at kind of shepherding and counseling and all those things, but they all do the same thing. Lastly, here in this verse, Paul instructs Titus to do this in every town. There was not one localized, centralized church on Crete. There were churches or assemblies of Christ followers in every town, multiple. This wasn't a, an elite Roman Catholic style, uh, from top down model, centralized location. No, this was localism at its finest. Another one of our core commitments here at Silver City, appointing elders in each town exactly where they lived so they could shepherd the flock where they lived. They weren't trying to shepherd a, a flock halfway across the island on the other side of the island. They were doing it in their community where they knew one another, where they knew the people, where they lived life. So, all right, appoint elders in every town, Titus. That's what you've got to do. All right, get to it. Get some pastors trained and, and appoint uh, them over these various churches. And I'll check back in with you soon. Love, Paul, XO. No, that's not what Paul says, is it? Paul tells Titus to, to put the cast on these churches so they can grow pop properly. To put the cage around these young plants. And the cast and the cage is what? Proper leadership. A cast has a certain fitting and a cage has a certain structure. This isn't a free-for-all appointment. This isn't pragmatism as if to say, oh, we really probably should have at least two elders in each church. So, so Titus, just get some elders, appoint them as elders, give them the title elders, check it off your list. No, 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 no. If these pastors, if these elders or overseers, whatever you want to call them, are watching over a certain group of, of people who represent the body of Christ, these eternal souls, and they're, they're tasked with, with giving the eternal truth of God's word, then it can't be just any, you know, Joe Schmo off the corner in Crete. There has to be some sort of standards, some sort of qualifications and that's what Paul gets into within the rest of our passage this morning. Listen, Titus 1, 6 through 9. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. For an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach. Then he gives some negatives. He must not be arrogant, quick-tempered, drunkard, violent, or greedy for gain. And then some positives. He must be hospitable, a lover of goods, self-controlled, upright, holy, disciplined. And here's his task. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. Right. Notice immediately that Paul uses the word overseer interchangeably with elder. Right. So that right there shows that um, we have one position, not two. All right. Uh, again, uh, with Titus being our field guide, if we survey the map, we have to ask ourselves, why does any of this really matter? Think about that. Why does any of this really matter? Why? Should there be qualifications for pastors that they have to meet? These seem to be extremely high standards. Well, why do we have standards and requirements for any sort of position? Whether it's you need to have had 10 years of teaching experience at this, you know, uh, professor level, or you need no experience, you can gain experience here, flipping burgers, whatever it is. Why do we have any of these things? Because there are standards and we have benchmarks. I mean, these standards do seem extremely high, do they not? Uh, I mean, can we compromise a little bit? What if he's a really great speaker and he delivers some of the best sermons uh, ever, maybe the best orator, the best presenter we've ever heard, but maybe He's the exact opposite of some of these qualifications. I mean, it's like you don't expect every pastor to actually embody these qualifications, do you? Really? No, I, I, I don't. God does. Because this is his word through Paul to Titus, to us. See, the desire to the office of elder is a noble task. It's a noble task, like he tells Timothy. It's one that comes with many, many risks and the witness of the entire church. It can be compromised by bad leaders. It can be compromised. To use an analogy, 
One bag, bad egg can ruin the whole omelet. Uh, last week at, at our, our big launch day, we had our breakfast and, and also lunch. We like to eat around here, which should tell you something. Uh, our dear sister, Sophia Collier, uh, love her so much. She was going to make this big egg casserole type thing, and she got down to the last egg to put into the batch to start it. And guess what? She cracked it open and it was black and rotten, and she dropped it in there before she could catch it, and it ruined the entire omelet. One bad egg, bad egg can ruin the entire omelet. The qualifications for an elder, hear me, they are meant to be high. Not everyone is supposed to be able to be one. The qualifications of Titus and 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy and even 1 Peter are given by God to display that the call to the pastorate is not one that is lightly or easily accessible. And this right here, God's infallible word, is the exact opposite of the mentality of the modern church because much of the modern church is not grounded in the infallible scriptures and what they say to every area of life, but they are grounded in Wall Street and social media given that that many modern evangelical churches are nothing more than a business trying to sell you a brand. That's what they are. CEOs, CFOs are what matter to the modern evangelical big Eva swampy world, not biblically qualified men who lead by example. You've heard big pharma, big government, big tech, all that stuff. There is a big Eva, I promise you. So these qualifications, Zach, what's, so, what's, what's the big deal about them? Well, let's look at them. Let's, let's examine these qualifications for just a moment for the elders, shall we? Firstly, I want you to notice what Paul repeats. In, uh, he repeats these two words in verse 6 and verse 7, and it's this, above reproach. Your translation may have the word blameless, same idea. Paul says an elder must be above reproach twice, and after each implementation or employment of this word, blameless or above reproach, you've got a description. You've got above reproach, description, and at the end, above reproach, description. You've got this list of attributes. So here's the big idea. When Paul says an elder must be above reproach or an elder must be blameless, everything that comes after that above reproach is what is meant by that above reproach. It's like, like a grocery list, grocery list, and then we list it. Above reproach, blameless, here's what it means. So the first above reproach and the second above reproach, they're concerned with two different spheres of life. Don't miss this. They're concerned with two different spheres of life for the potential elder. Paul isn't repeating himself. Uh, Paul isn't like on a crutch word, ah, above reproach, above reproach, you know, how we get stuck on words like literally or absolutely or something like that. Uh, the first above reproach has to do with the sphere of the potential elder's home life. And then the second blameless or above reproach has to do with his personal character. Why is that? Why are we concerned with home life and with personal character? Why doesn't Paul just lift, list a bunch of skill sets? Like, oh, an elder, he's got to be a great speaker, perfect rhetorician, uh, dress in the best, latest fashion, be able to sell a vision, all of these things. And, you know, especially like good on ROIs. He's got to be able to have that, right? No, why does he not list these things? Because that's what the modern world would expect him to list. But in the real world, which is God's world, an elder is not some, you know, CEO huckster trying to win you for your money and your buy-in, right? He's not walking around in $2,000 sneakers on roids like Stephen Furtick. Sorry if that's an accusation. But he's not doing those things, He's not concerned with what we see in the mega churchianity, big, fast, famous kind of celebrity pastor model. He's not concerned with that at all. He's concerned with biblical influence and godly influence. He's to be a cast, the biblical elders to be a cast of example. So verse 6, the first above reproach, which is the first set of qualifications the husband of one wife, faithful children, well-run household. Well, I said, let's kindle that fire. Let's go on and just let her break on loose. An elder, an overseer, a pastor, 
controversial, but because the modern church has made it controversial by disobeying the word of God, a, a pastor can only be a man. I'm not going to beat around the bush. It's just, actually, let's just set the bush on fire. How about that? We'll have another burning bush here because the burning bush is where God speaks and we have it before us this morning. Amen. There is no such thing as a woman pastor. That is a Halloween costume. Women are not called to the pastorate. This is not some cultural thing. This is not Paul being a bigot or a misogynist. This is Paul being biblical. The church that says it has a woman pastor that meets all of these qualifications and that Paul was just a product of his time, that church is a church of pure hypocrisy. Why? Uh Uh-oh, I'm pointing fingers. Yes, because that lady pastor, which is, again, just a little shenanigan, uh, who calls Paul a bigot and lambasts him as a product of his time. This is progress. She is blind to the fact that she is a bigot against God's word and is a product of her time, which is rampant with rebellious feminism. Was Paul a product of his time? Yep, you bet. Actually, maybe they're right about that, but they're not right in the way that they think they are. Paul was a product of his time because Paul was produced as an apostle by Christ himself on the road to Damascus. None of this is Paul being a misogynist. None of this is Paul making up his own stuff. This is all a common sense, basic Bible 101. God created man for dominion and woman to help in that dominion. There is a structure. There is a covenant. There is a head. It is Christ and his bride. It's not the bride and Christ. See, it all goes together. Uh, does this mean that women can't serve in the church? Does this mean that women are just bags of sentient carbon floating around that need to shut down, uh, sit down and shut up? Of course not. As Paul would say, by no means. Women serve the church so often in ways that if they didn't, the church would crumble. But God has spoken. Women cannot, cannot be pastors. They cannot be under shepherds. They cannot be rulers. They cannot be under representatives of the local body. Our great representative, the perfect prophet, the perfect priest, the perfect king, the perfect elder is who? The God-man, Jesus Christ. We have to understand God has given a design to everything and he has designed his church's collective people to be fit into a mold. It's not arbitrary. If people want to complain about about this being bigoted. Like this is the main concern for so many people, for so many churches is, well, I I mean, I guess they're just on the whole diversity, equity, inclusion junk bandwagon anymore. We've got to have a woman pastor. No, really? Like you're concerned about that and you're concerned about women being discriminated against because they can't stand in a pulpit? I mean, Look at the Southern Baptist Convention. This is still raging. Like, why is this even a debate? I'll tell you why it's a a raging debate in the Southern Baptist Convention is because they've let critical race theory just walk right in the door. And this is your big concern? Yeah, this is even a big concern in the PCA. I mean, the PCA has their own stuff that they're going through with Revoice. But look at the, the world around us. It is confused to the gill, to the core with gender stuff and uh, androgyny and the transgender revolution and, and androgyny just means that there's a blurred line between male and female there's no distinction think about this if the church is so concerned about this of well we've got to have women pastors i don't care what the bible says hey, there there's no Male or female in Christ, yeah, we're talking about that in salvation, not in function and role in the church. There is a structure. When there is a blurred line in the church of women and men, they just all do the same stuff, and there's the same titles, and there's no distinction, however perfectly they present the gospel, that church, and they may do it 
perfectly well, what we are doing is displaying to the world as the church that there actually is legitimate le legitimacy to androgyny, that there is no distinction between male and female, that we can all just do the same and we confirm their worldview, their sin-sick worldview. You want to be radical, church? You want to be radical, Christian? Then here's what you do. You fight the demonic religion of wokeism by doing the radical thing of actually believing what the Bible says and doing it. You, you ladies, you want to be the most radical feminist of all time? You really want to stick out in society today? Wear a dress. Dress like a woman. Be modest. Men, you want to, you want to do the same thing? Start wearing like khakis. Start taking care of yourself. Stop being so effeminate. Stop with the lotion. Right? Be this kind of caricature of an of a 1800s pioneer man because that culture at least had a God-given understanding of what was going on and who they were. And now we're just simply eating and on the lie of, did God really say? Anyway, these pastors, they can only be men, period. Moving on, the, the man, he must be the husband of one wife, literally right here in the Greek, a one woman man. This qualification is also one that has been intentionally twisted in our modern culture because we don't like what it says. We just don't like that. He's got to be a one woman man. And you will get liberal scholars, excuse me, and liberal pastors, and they'll say, well, this one woman man stuff means that you can't be a polygamist. <laughs> well, duh. This is always like one of the go-to. Polygamy was not even prevalent really in the Jewish or Greco-Roman culture during this time. It, it wasn't. Like multiple wives, it, it wasn't really a thing. It, it, well, that means you can't have a concubine and you can't participate in ten, uh, temple prostitution, that pagan stuff. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is just common sense. It, the liberal scholars and pastors, they always talk themselves right into the position Paul is advocating here, which is Jesus' position, which is actually the position of all of Scripture from the beginning, even the, the sinful parts about polygamy and God working through that, accommodating, we call it divine accommodation, working through those sins, like, you know, Abraham, the founder of what we would say Judaism, even though it's God. It, well, it means you can't engage in pederasty, which was really big at that time. Okay, like that was really big at that time. Pederasty. It means prepping or grooming children, specifically boys, for sexual lewdness. Like that's not big now. Scholars act like it was, like pederasty was rampant, like on every street corner, like they had pederasty, like clinics. Hmm, what about that? Sounds kind of familiar. No, it was only the elites of society just like it is now. Did you, did you see any guys, randos, that were flipping burgers at McDonald's on Epstein Island? No, it was presidents and billionaires. Well, one woman man can't mean, Zach, it can't mean that he has been faithful to his wife because there are all these cultural contingencies. Actually, no, that's, that's exactly what it means. And when you hear someone trying to convince you and wiggle their way around this, what they are doing is participating in projection. The cultural contingencies that they're supposedly so concerned with uh, in Paul's day are not Paul's at all. They're their own. We live in the most sexualized society of all time to the point where, like bizarro negative world, fidelity is now a weird thing. Like, you mean to tell me you're, you're in a heterosexual marriage? Weird. That's so, you know, five years ago. And you mean to tell me you've been faithful to your spouse and never explored your sexual freedom with anyone else? You're a dinosaur. You're a, you're a bigot. You're living in a, the handmaid's tale. Yeah, here's the deal. Here's the deal. There's power and influence in church leadership. That's the transparent truth. And we all know this, but it's not raw power and influence for powers and influence sake. It's the power of God's word and the influence to prod the flock, to know the word and do what it says and to conform them into the image of Christ. There are tons of men and tons of women who see that power comes with church leadership and want 
any way possible to have it because they, like their father Satan, crave a power they cannot have. They have been taken to a high mountain and shown all the kingdoms of the earth, Luke 4, Matthew 4, and they bow their knee to an angel of light who they believe is a messenger of God but is a blackest of sinners. The husband of one wife means exactly what it plainly means. You must be, have been, and continue to be faithful to your wife. It does not mean that if your wife dies and you're a widower, you can't be an elder. That, that's, that's another topic. That's not what Paul's talking about. Paul is concerned with present tense stuff right now. One woman, men, right now, faithful, not adulterous. That's what it says. Why do we twist it and wiggle around it? Why does it make us uncomfortable? If elders are to follow the example of Christ and to display to their congregation what it means to be godly, then ask yourself, stop and ask yourself, has there ever been a time, a point in time where Christ was unfaithful to his bride, the church? Answer, never. An elder must be full of fidelity to faithfulness to his wife. This isn't concerned about what he did before he was a Christian. This qualification and all subsequent qualifications are present tense active right now. No signs of stopping. These qualifications for elders, for men who are already part of these local congregations in Crete, not pagans outside that could be good ideas, no, they're Christians. They're a part of these churches that can be trained up. Maybe they need a little bit of help. Maybe they've got great track records. Maybe they've got tons of potential. Maybe they're perfect right now and they've, they just need to continue to be encouraged. They're men and they're faithful men. One woman, man. Going on quickly. His children are faithful and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. This means this man is faithful to his wife and is faithfully watching over his house, raising his children in the fear and admonition of the word, the Lord, I'm sorry. This word here for children is the word techno, which is a general word used to describe not only children or infants and toddlers, but also adults. The qualification of faithful children. It's one that Doug Wilson calls the neglected qualification. Whatever you think of him, I don't care, but he's right about that. His children are faithful. The elder's children are faithful. What happens if a guy meets all of the qualifications, but he has that, that one adult child that is apostate and renounces Christ? Let's say he's already a pastor. Does that mean that he's disqualified? This is where we need prudence. Maybe. He, he Possibly. Does he have to step down? What's the situation look like? Was he always gone to conference trips and locked up in his study writing books and at church meetings and all these things? Then he probably, yeah, probably he is. Yeah, he probably should step down because he sacrificed his child for some sort of church career. But if the man was faithfully catechizing his children, raising them in the fear and admonition of the Lord constantly, lovingly, and everybody knows that, then I think he continues on in ministry with immense heartache. But what about younger kids? Let's say that you've got a guy that's just wildly qualified, except his children, let's say that they're 5, 10, and 15. They're all just a bunch of, of heathen, wild, crazy people just running around screaming. They have no self-control. They're always sour pusses. They're always yelling at one another. The family's yelling at one another. But man, he can really preach. Do you think that he's disqualified or unqualified if he is an elder candidate? Yeah, he's, he's unqualified for the moment. He needs to get his house in order. Why does an elder have to have their house in order? Why does that matter? Why is it the first sphere of blamelessness that Paul lists as qualifications for elders in the home? Verse 7 tells us why. As God's steward, he must be a brave reproach. That word steward is two words blended to make one new word. Steward here in the Greek is oikonomos. Oikos for Greek is Greek for house. And you know this word because everybody in here probably at some point has went to Kroger or Walmart and bought some delicious Oikos Greek yogurt. Now you know, it means house yogurt. Huh, what about that? And namos, we use this word all the time, nomenclature is where, that, uh, where we get that from. Namos means law. So literally this word's kind of a, a compound. It means God's house ruler. If a man is going to be a manager, a leader, a ruler of God's house, the local church, then that man's house must display, and it will display, how he will manage God's house. 
if a, a man is chaotic, what do you think he's going to do with God's house? And what do you think that local house of God is going to look like? It's going to be crazy. A, a man's family and the name it bears is often a greater witness to the man than his own words. Why? Because the true character of the man comes out and is evidenced in how his household functions. He, hear me say this. If you can bold text this in your mind today, show me a man in his household and I will tell you the character of that man. I don't even have to know him. Let me sit down and observe his household for a day. I'll tell you the character of that man. That's exactly what Paul is saying to Titus here, even structurally in the letter here, because everything that comes after the second above reproach, it has to do with this character. The family displays the character. All right, quickly, starting in, in verse 7b here, the, the second half of verse 7, what is this elder to be like individually? A great orator, good influence on social media, great voice, great haircut. No, as we go through these, I want you to notice that there is only one skill that he has to be able to do, and it's a skill that should naturally arise from all of these other character traits. It's not a resume. Listen to these. As God's steward, he must be blameless, and here it is. Not arrogant, quick-tempered, drunkard, violent, greedy for gain. He has to be hospitable, lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, disciplined, and he has to be anchored to the trustworthy word as taught. See, what is interesting is that many of these words here used by Paul to describe the character of a potential elder, that ideal elder, are only used a handful of times throughout the rest of the Scripture. Some of them are only used right here in Titus. That should tell us that even the, the words, the unique words that describe the, the position of an elder, that position is unique based on the words that are used for them. Paul gives five negative don'ts and six positives be like this. So above reproach, blameless, all these character, characteristics, they add up to being above reproach. Even that, that word blameless, above reproach, it's only used five times in the entire New Testament. Twice of them are right here. Uh, two of them are right here in our verses this morning. Let's look at the negatives quickly. He must not be arrogant, meaning he's not self-willed, stubborn, being a know-it-all, a narcissist, won't take any direction, used two times in all of Scripture, right here and then in First Peter. He must not be quick-tempered. He's someone that becomes very angry, very, very angry, quickly. He's a hulk. This is the only time that this word is used in all of Scripture right here. He must not be a drunkard, literally here in the original, a wine addict. It's only used twice in Scripture here and in the uh, similar uh, cousin letter almost, 1 Timothy, in 1 Timothy 3. He must not be violent, meaning a striker, a bully, a brawler. It's not an argumentative attitude that kind of goes along with quick, quick tempered. This, this means he, he's not a cage fighter. He doesn't get mad at someone and serve and say, after this, you come out back and I'm going to whip you behind the shed. I'm going to punch you in the nose. Two times used in Scripture, right here and again in the similar elder qualifications in 1 Timothy 3. And he must not be greedy for gain, meaning he's shamefully greedy, obsessed with making money, ex ex obsessed with maiming, obsessed with stuff. Two times here and again in 1 Timothy 3. All right, now the positives. Let's see the unique positives. He must be hospitable, meaning he's fond of guests in his home and in his church. He's a welcoming spirit. Three times it's used in Scripture. Here, 1 Timothy 3 and in 1 Peter 4. He must be a lover of good. All right, if he's a lover of good, hospitable means he's a lover of people. And here, lover of good means he's a lover of good things. He's, he takes in quality content, not mindless garbage. The only time that this word's used in Scripture. He has to be self-controlled. This, this word right here, self-controlled, sophron, is, it's, better, it's better translated as prudent or sober-minded. And some translations have it like that. The ESB has it as self-controlled. Uh, this, this means he's wise, he's temperate, he doesn't crack under mental pressure, he thinks through things. It's used four times in Scripture, once in 1 Timothy and all three others in the book of Titus right here, which should tell you that it's a big, big theme. He must be upright, just, 
He's fair, impartial. Now, this one's used quite a bit. 70 times, holy, you know, to, to model godliness, to be dedicated unto God, mimicking God, emulating God, also used quite a bit in Scripture. But the thing is, is these two right here, uh, uh, upright and holy, these are the only two traits that are linked to Scripture, and the Scriptures are, uh, they, they describe God Himself. Listen to this. Deuteronomy 32, 4, the national anthem of Israel. The rock, his work is perfect for all of his ways are justice or upright. A God of faithfulness and without iniquity or holy, just and What about that? Just and upright is he and holy. They describe God. So this, this elder is, is mimicking, is emulating, is echoing, is displaying God. He's godly. Lastly, disciplined. This is, the own, this is the one, I'm sorry, that, that really means self-control when we think about self-controlled. He's a master of the self, disciplined, regimented, has his body under control and his mind. Right here, the only place in Scripture where this word is used. Now, the one skill, which again would naturally arise from these character traits, verse 9, he must hold fast or be devoted to or more literally anchored to the trustworthy word, the Scriptures, as he has been taught. Hold fast, this right here, hold fast, anchored to. Only time it's used in Scripture. Why must he be anchored to the trustworthy word? So he can give instruction in sound doctrine. Sound here means healthy, healthy doctrine, uh, which means the knowledge about God, which is contained in the Scriptures. It's correct belief. So, so there's the positive. There's the positive anchoring, and then there's a negative. So he can rebuke those who contradict it. See, the call on a man's life to be a pastor is a unique call, displayed even the unique words used to describe that call, and it's not for everyone on the street. The church, we must regain a high view of the office of elder, a high view based on the scriptures, based in the scriptures, not based in the abomination of business-style church. Paul doesn't tell Titus how to set up elders, does he? He tells him what to look for. These men, Titus was to look for and set as elders and leaders, were to have good, strong households and good, godly lives. They're all based on the, the, the four forms of government, and Paul understands these. He's, he's talking about actually three of the four forms of government, or three of the four spheres of government, if you're familiar with Kuiper. And these four spheres are self-government, family government, church government, and civil government. But, but think through the, the logic of this. A healthy, biblical-based self-government, right, disciplined self, gives way, should give way to a healthy family government, how the family and the household functions, which gives way to a sound church government because these, these sound uh, families come together. And that should ripple out into a society that has a healthy civil government. These standards and qualifications, hear me, church, they're not time-stamped. They're not cultural. They're not time-bound, rather. They're universal and eternal. These are the same qualifications that are given to Timothy, who is in Ephesus, hundreds of miles away, and that has slightly different culture. These qualifications, they're meant to be normative for all time. Why? Because Paul was the example, and Paul was writing both of these letters, and it was hit. No, because they are based in the character of the one who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. They are based in the one that all are called to emulate, Jesus Christ. Amen? Now, what are we to do with this? What is our application? Why does any of this matter? Is this just a sermon for myself since I'm an elder? Well, of course it is, but is it, is it for anyone else? Is it just for people that, that, that think that they're called to the ministry and by people I mean men? Of course not. This is for everyone, and I don't want us to skip over this because this is, as 2 Timothy 3.16 says, part of Scripture that's breathed out, and it is profitable for everything. How does this apply to you? Well, I have one point of application this morning. One point, so that means you should have a, an easy time remembering it. This single point of application comes by us viewing Titus 1, 5 through 9, this, this elder qualification list, and subsequently 1 Timothy 3. Go read that this week. We're to view for Titus 1, 5 through 9, through the lens of Hebrews 13, 7. Hear what Hebrews 13, 7 says. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life right here and imitate their faith. 
God gives godly leaders for his people to imitate. Godly leaders in any church are the cast that the church is to be set straight by, the stability that they give them. If, they, if a, a healthy biblical church has multiple elders and they're godly, they have godly homes and the like, does that mean that, that these men are perfect and that church is perfect? Of course not. Do, do godly elders check every one of these boxes with pride like it's a resident? Oh, I'm humble. I'm not arrogant. Mm, sure, right. Of course not. What it does mean is that these leaders, they have these fruits, they, they have these uh, qualities present, and they are continually growing and being cultivated. God raises up godly leaders for his people to imitate that means whether you're a man who is not called to, to ministry or a stay-at-home mom or a teenager or even a child, we have leaders ahead of us. All of us have leaders ahead of us that we are called to emulate. I have men in my life that are over me, the, the, the elders at East River Church. I love each of them dearly that I emulate, that I, I look up to because they are godly. Why do we have these, these elders, these people that we look up to? Because the church, the body of Christ, according to Ephesians 4, is meant to build one another up in love. So I ask you, if, if, we're, if we're meant to emulate this ideal elder, if all Christians are to look at this elder list and go, you know what, I may not ever be in ministry, I may even be a, a woman and, and I'm not called to the pastorate, but I'm to look at these qualifications, both the household and the personal character traits, and emulate them. So, is your house in order? Is your house in order? Is there a past sin that has torn down the pillars of your home? Was it an affair? Was it bad finances? Was it a fight that you just can't get over? Then repent, reconcile, and restore your household upon the foundation of God's Word. You who have children under your care, are you training them to fear the Lord? Are, are you training them to be reverent? Are you continually, every morning, every day, every night, every car ride, every time you go out in public, every moment you can, putting them on the path of righteousness, according to Psalm 1? They are talents that we have been given by God to steward. They're not meant to be wild and unruly. And yes, they will be at some times. But are you trying with all your might, according to the power of the Spirit, to put them on the right path. Because, beloved, let me tell you something. Many times, wild children, it's not ADHD. It's, it's our fault as parenting. It's our fault in parenting. This is not me shaming anyone. This is also not me laying a, a blanket statement for families that have children with, with special needs. This is just to the average Christian family who needs to hear this. Parenting is hard. It's hard. It's not sitting your kids in front of a screen all day. They're tender shoots, little plants that you have to water and you have to prune. And sometimes you've got to transplant. You've got to cast them up. You've got to be the example for them and point them to good examples to follow. Do not forsake your children and cause your home to be out of order for your convenience or because you're addicted to a piece of glass that vibrates in your pocket every five seconds. Is your household in order? Your marriage, your children, your finances, your priorities, if they are not, repent and listen. Not just repent. You're not left in the dark. Ask for help. Go to someone that you know models these things and ask them for help. And not just to anyone, a Christian. What about your personal individual self? Are you in order? You, dear Christian, can, can you look to this list in Titus and humbly say, I'm not perfect in any of these traits. I will be in glory, but I desire to grow in each of these. If you don't desire that, if you don't look at this list and that's not your reaction, it must be. Are you arrogant and self-centered? Are you concerned only about yourself? Are you sociopathic thinking about what can I do to manipulate people to get stuff for me? Then repent, die to yourself, and follow Christ. Are you a hothead? Then repent and, and have the living word of God's word poured out on that fire. Go to it constantly. It will do the work. Are you a drunkard? Well, of course, Zach, I'm not. You know that. Well, then let me bring to the, the surface the general equity, the general principle of what this means. Do you have issues restraining yourself with any sort of consumption, whether it be drink, alcohol, pop, food? That's the big one for everybody, especially in the South, right? 
What about, are you addicted? Are you a drunkard? Are you an, uh, have no self-control with your phone, with social media, with streaming, then my friend, be sober-minded, be wise, take control of that, repent, see that God gives good things, but those good things are not to become God's. Are you violent? Do you consume violent media, whether it be what you watch or what you listen to, and then wonder why you're violent to those around you? Are you? Are you harsh? then repent and pray that the Lord would calm that forest fire of your tongue, or even, I pray, it's not your fists. Pray that that He would cause you to repent and that He would settle you and give you grace and peace. Church, look unto the cast of a leader right here in Titus and in 1 Timothy 3 and in 1 Peter and emulate them as we are told to do in Hebrews 13. Let each of us embody these traits and encourage one another towards hospitality and goodness and, and wisdom and righteousness and holiness and self-control. And when we encourage each other not just to do those, but to do those things, to be those things, by holding fast to the Scriptures, which teach us how to do those things. Let us see the cast and know that broken bones When they are set, they hurt for a moment, but they grow back stronger when guided by a solid, strong, durable cast. Maybe some of this hurts you this week. Good, I pray it does, but it's not because I want to hurt you because the Word of God wants to intentionally hurt you. It's for your good so that you would grow strong and healthy in the Lord. Our cast is not merely godly leaders like that we say are godly. It is Christ himself who these leaders are called to emulate and to be like, just like him. He, Christ Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who lived the perfect life that we cannot live, died the death of the rebellious sinner that we all deserve, so that those who repent of their sins and follow after him shall become like he is. First John, may this be you, may this be each of us here. May we be brothers and sisters, fathers and mothers, children of a common faith in Christ Jesus. Yes, may it be so. Grace and peace be with you all. Let's pray.